to the graduation of the Master Seminary, celebrating our 30th year of God's blessing and the preparation of men for ministry all around the world. We commend these men to all of you as those who have completed their various degree programs. They received their commendation from the board who affirms the accomplishments that they have made upon the recommendation of the faculty. So these are men that we all commend with grateful hearts, eager to see what the Lord will do with them in the years to come. Welcome. Thank you. You may be seated. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Chapter 4 continues, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort 
with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Gentlemen, fulfill your ministry. Remain standing for prayer. Please bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, on this joyous occasion, we bow our hearts in gratitude as we consider your abundant faithfulness. It is so clearly evident both in the history of this seminary and in the lives of each of these men graduating tonight. As we reflect on all that you have done, far above all that we could ask or think, our hearts are overwhelmed with thanksgiving and with praise. We rejoice in the diligent efforts and academic accomplishments of these graduates, but our celebration tonight is not focused on their labors, but rather on the work that you have accomplished in them and through them. We rejoice, Father, not only in what you have done, but in what you will yet do through these men as they go out as workers into the harvest. All that we celebrate this evening is possible only by your grace and through your power. And so we say with the psalmist, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. And it is in that high and exalted name that we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you. Now it's your turn to sing. Right there in the commencement program, O oh God, our help in ages past. And let's stand as we sing together. Since this is a milestone in our seminary story, 30 years, I uh, decided to reach back into the past to a text of scripture that I used very early in the life of the seminary to reflect to our students what I felt they needed to know as the pillars that would essentially hold up their ministry. It comes from a text of Scripture that all of us in ministry are very familiar with, Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to read for you verses 11 through 16. Paul is writing to young Timothy, his protege, his disciple, his son in the faith, and the one to whom he will pass the baton of ministry. And he says to him, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. A call to ministry, a definition of ministry from which the Apostle Paul launches into a doxology. The phrase that I want to draw to your attention is found in the opening verse that I read, verse 11, man of God. 
you men of God, a man who belongs to God. This is, by the way, a peculiar and specific title. At the seminary, we would consider all of you to be men of God. We are committed to preparing and shaping and, and building men of God. That really is an Old Testament title. It was first used of Moses, who spoke for God. It was used of several angelic messengers, including one who announced Samson's birth, a message from God. It was used to describe a prophet who spoke for God to Eli, the high priest, predicting severe judgment on his wicked family. That title, Man of God, was used of Samuel, who spoke divine truth. It was used of Elijah, Elisha, David, and many others, but it was always used for a spokesman of God. It's used 70 times in the Old Testament, always referring to someone who had an official message from God Himself. It is then, as I said, a very unique, a very peculiar, and a very specific title for one who speaks on behalf of God with a message from the divine Lord Himself. The phrase, man of God, is only used two times in the New Testament, and both times in reference to Timothy. The other time is in 2 Timothy 3, where the Apostle Paul says it is the Word of God that will make you into a mature man of God. Men of God, then, are an elite line of men whose lives are lifted above worldly enterprises, lifted above worldly ambitions and worldly goals, to be devoted to what is eternal and what is divine. A man of God belongs to a spiritual order, an order with which things temporal and transitory and perishing and passing have little significance. Anyone who is called to preach is a man of God. What are the identifying marks of the man of God that we see in this passage? There are actually four characteristics that the Apostle Paul puts before us. Number one, the man of God is known by what he flees from. The man of God is known by what he flees from. Verse 11 says, but flee from these things, you men of God. It's the Greek word poege from which we get the word fugitive. The man of God is a running man, and he is running from certain things. It pictures someone who is running from a plague or a, a poisonous snake or an attacking and deadly enemy. He is a fleeing man. To be in gospel ministry, to be a man of God, means that you are going to run away from certain things. Back in chapter 1, verse 4, Timothy is instructed, as we are, not to pay attention, for example, to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. In chapter 4, the man of God again is warned that he must have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, he must discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. At the end of chapter 6 in verse 20, again, Paul says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. If you're going to be a man of God, there are things you must flee, and you must run hard 
all your life away from these things. In his second letter to Timothy chapter 2, in verse 22, Paul says, flee youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome. Well, lots of things to flee. But what exactly is Paul referring to here in chapter 6 and verse 11? Flee from these things. Well, if you just go back, as we well know in the text of Scripture, everything is connected. And you go back to verse 5, you read in the middle of the verse, there are men of depraved mind, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. In other words, that being a a minister, a religious person, is a great way to get rich. There are such men of depraved mind who are deprived of the truth, who think that ministry is a way to become wealthy. But godliness, he says, actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs." That passage is used frequently in the pulpit to speak to the people of God and warn them against the love of money. But its context is a direct address to a man of God. And in verse 11, when Paul says, flee from these things, he's referring precisely to these things attached to the love of money. The evils and vices associated with financial gain, greed and all its attendant iniquities. The strong, motivating desire for money has no place in the ministry. This you must run from. This is the characteristic sin, by the way, of false teachers who preach for money, who make merchandise of people, who seek filthy lucre. From Balaam to Judas, they run the pages of Scripture. From the false prophets of Israel who were greedy dogs that never had enough and were concerned for their personal worth, to the covetous prophetess, prophets and priests of Jeremiah's day, to the prophets of Ezekiel's time who could be bought by handfuls of barley and pieces of bread, to the preachers who divined for money and the unruly and empty talkers and deceivers of Crete who subverted whole households teaching for money. They've all been perverted, prostituting the gifts and calling of God for personal gain. The history of the church is full of them down to this very hour. The love of money has perverted many. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul said, we're not like many peddling the Word of God. Use the word kapalas, which means a huckster, a con man, selling something for personal gain, something that is substandard. We all are aware, I think, of the materialistic condition of the church in America. It can be clearly seen in the fact that it isn't the opulent, indulgent, Midas-like gold touch. It isn't the grandiose self-indulgence. It isn't the consuming drive for comfort and pleasure. It isn't the indulgent of, indulgence of every material item imaginable that scandalizes American Christians. It's sex. But the love of money is equally scandalous. God hated the materialistic lust as much as the sexual lust. But the church today has bought into the blasphemous wealth and prosperity theology that has made God the author of an accommodating theology that turns this fleeing on its head. 
We need to reject the doctrine of demons that says God wants us rich. Paul said, I have coveted no man's gold or silver or apparel. Paul said, I would never make the gospel chargeable to anyone. You may be a preacher, you may be a pastor, but if you're in it for the money, you are not a man of God. Secondly, a man of God is known not only by what he flees from, but what he follows after. He is a running man, and he is running hard away from, and he is running hard toward. And what is it that he runs to? Back to verse 11. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Proverbs 15, 9 says, The Lord loves those that pursue righteousness. Not success, not fame, not popularity, not esteem, not reputation, but virtue. And Paul names a number of things, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness or meekness. These are spiritual virtues with which we're very familiar. Righteousness is doing right on the outside. Godliness is desiring right on the inside. Faith is essentially faithfulness. Love is love, sacrificial love. Perseverance is endurance. Gentleness is meekness. Run so hard, men, that you never let these out of your sight. Don't find yourself in a place in life where they're so far out of your sight that you are in danger if you don't catch up. Don't be an unholy preacher. Don't be an unsanctified vessel, unfit for the master's use. In Psalm 50, verses 16 and 17, we read, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes? What right have you to take my covenant into your mouth? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. Psalm 101.6 says, He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not. People have every right to evaluate us that same way. If you're walking in a blameless way, then you have a right to minister. If you're practicing deceit, you do not. The Apostle Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 9, you know the verse, I beat my body into subjection so that in preaching to others I don't become a dokimos disqualified. You don't want to be disqualified. You didn't come this far to be disqualified. You didn't come this far to crash and burn. I know the thought enters all of our minds as we launch out into ministry, can I survive? Can I be standing at the end? Can I be faithful through the whole time of my life? You can, but you must pursue these things. Proverbs 632 and 33, a very strong reminder. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. Paul says, minister must be above reproach. Do that, and you have a reproach that will not be blotted out. On the positive side, people will feel the power of a godly life. It was John Owen who said a minister may fill his pews, his communion roll, the mouths of the public, but what he is on his knees in secret before Almighty God, that he is and no more. In Irish history, there's a great uh, badge of barony called the Red Hand of O'Neill. The motto of the ancient Irish O'Neill family. 
There was a group on an expedition to Ireland. The word uh, was passed along that whoever's hand touched the coast of Ireland first would become the family that owned the land. They would become the baron, and they would take that land as their own. One of the men, named O'Neill, from whom actually descended the princes of Ulster, rowed as furiously as he could, but another boat was in the lead. What would he do? He wanted that land. The historian writes, with a grim look of mingled wrath and triumph, at the rival boat, the strong-minded, iron-nerved O'Neill dropped the oars, seized a battle axe, chopped off one of his hands, and threw it on shore. Drastic action. Sound familiar? If your hand offends you, Jesus said what? Cut it off. Drastic action. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Deal dramatically, deal drastically with your sin for something far more than a piece of land. Sin disgraces the ministry. Sin dishonors the Lord. And sin may be a fatal wound in your life. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and meekness. Spurgeon once said, a graceless pastor is a blind man elected to a professorship of optics. Philosophizing about light and vision, while he himself is absolutely in the dark, he is a dumb man elevated to the chair of music. He is a deaf man fluent on harmonies and symphonies. He is a mole professing to educate eagles. Yes, you may be a preacher, but if you do not pursue holiness, you are no man of God. Thirdly, the man of God is known not only by what he flees from, what he follows after, but what he fights for. Look at verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We know in the Bible that the man of God is a boxer, a wrestler, a soldier, a battler, a protagonist, a warrior. We wage war against the kingdom of darkness. We wage war against the sin in our own flesh. We wage war against false teaching, false doct doctrine error. The Apostle Paul, looking at ministry, said, there is an open door and there are many adversaries. Paul came to the end of his life, and what did he say? I have fought the good fight. Do you think it's been tough in seminary? That was just practice. Now you get to do it for real, and eternal souls are at stake. You'll spend your whole life fighting. The word here, fight, is agonizomai. The fight is agon, agonize the agony, spiritual conflict. And by the way, fighting in ancient, um, ancient terms, I guess you could say, was very different than the kind of fighting we see. We, we look at a boxing match and they have padded gloves and the worst they can do is give cauliflower ears and fat noses to each other, maybe a concussion or two. Gloves on Greek boxers, for example, were fur-lined inside, but on the outside they were made of oxide and embedded with lead and iron. And the loser often had his eyes gouged out. A lot more than just slapping each other around with puffy bags on your hands. They saw the battle image as dead serious. And this kind of language is all through the writings, particularly of the Apostle Paul. And you're going to be put out into ministry at a time when the church and the evangelical movement isn't really interested in fighting. They're just interested in being accepted. They have a, a, a severe case of spiritual AIDS. 
That is a deficient spiritual immune system. They can die from a thousand heresies. Every possible conceivable and inconceivable Trojan horse can uh, be welcomed into the city and set loose its error freely. Paul says you have to fight because you have to get a grip on the eternal life. What does he mean by that? He means you're dealing with things that are eternal. This is what you fight for. These are eternal issues. You're not like everybody else in the world. You're battling for the souls of men and women. All your issues are everlasting issues. We're warring with the forces of hell, the power of sin, the corruption of the culture, the strength of the world system around us, and the weakness of the church. You have to understand this battle matters because it's about eternal life. And Paul reminds Timothy, look, you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What do you think that confession was? That must have been when Timothy said, I will be faithful. You made that confession, that you were willing to go and fight the battle. You are fighting for eternal things. In the second letter, Paul reminds Timothy again that he is a soldier who must please his commander. A man of God is known because he is fleeing, because he is following, because he is fighting. And there's a fourth. A man of God is known by what he is faithful to. Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God, I command you, God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus. That's very much like the language of 2 Timothy 4. It sets up the, the immense accountability that you have before God and Christ. Very much like what Paul said just before he said, preach the word. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Why does he bring that in? Because Jesus is your model of faithfulness in the darkest possible hour when your life might be at stake. I charge you to follow your Lord and hold on to a good confession of the truth as He did and keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's calling for faithfulness no matter how difficult. A thoughtful exegesis, by the way, of this term commandment leads me to conclude that it refers to the whole of revealed Scripture. The commandment. The commandment. The man of God is known by what he is faithful to, and what he is faithful to is the divine revelation, the truth. He is a man of the truth. At all costs, even if he stands before someone who has his life in his hands. He is cho solemnly charged before God who gives life and takes it. He is solemnly charged before Jesus Christ who under severe duress never wavered in his adherence to God's Word. He is charged to guard the truth, the sacred trust, until the end of the age, even if it means he loses his life. As we read a little earlier in the sixth chapter, you're a guardian of truth. That should mark you. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. You're the proclaimer. Take heed then to yourself and to your doctrine. So what to look for in a pastor? Look for a man of God. And when you're looking for a man of God, what are you looking for? A man who flees the corrupting influence of money, the man who follows after righteousness, godliness. You're, you're going to be a man who's bent on 
pleasing God. And you're also going to be a man who will make a good confession no matter what the price. You will fight to the very end unwaveringly true to the revelation of God. Young minister came up to Donald Gray Barnhouse, the great Presbyterian preacher in Philadelphia, the past, said, Dr. Barnhouse, I'd give the world to be able to preach like you. Dr. Barnhouse said, good, it's exactly what it'll cost you. This is our duty, men. This is our calling. Now, here are some suggestions from somebody to help us be effective at this. This is a little bit edited by me. Any man who claims to be a man of God, this is how we should treat him. You ready? Fling him into his office. Tear the office sign from the door and nail on the door, study. Take him off the mailing list. Lock him up with his books and his computer and his Bible. Slam him down on his knees before texts and broken hearts and the flick of lives in a superficial flock before a holy God. Force him to be the one man in our surfeited communities who knows about God. Throw him into the ring to box with God until he learns how short his arms are. Engage him to wrestle with God all the night through and let him come out only when he's bruised and beaten into being a blessing. Shut his mouth forever spouting remarks and stop his tongue forever tripping lightly over every non-essential. Require him to have something to say before he dares break the silence. Bend his knees in the lonesome valley. Burn his eyes with weary study. Wreck his emotional poise with worry for God and make him exchange his pious stance for a humble walk with God. And when at long last, he dares assay the pulpit, ask him if he has a word from God. If he doesn't, dismiss him. Tell him you can read the morning paper and digest the latest television news, and you can think through the day's superficial problems and manage the community's weary issues and bless the sordid baked potatoes and green beans ad infinitum, probably better than he can. And command him not to come back until he's read and reread, written and rewritten, until he can stand up, worn and forlorn, and say, Thus says the Lord. Break him across the board of his ill gotten popularity. Smack him hard with his own prestige. Corner him with questions about God. Cover him with demands for celestial wisdom and give him no escape until he's backed against the wall of the Word, and sit down before him and listen to the only word he has left, God's Word. Let him be totally ignorant of the downstreet gossip, but give him a chapter and order him to walk around in it, camp on it, sup with it, and come at last to speak it backward and forward until all he says about it rings with the truth of eternity. And when he's burned out, by the flaming word, when he's consumed at last by the fiery grace blazing through him, and when he's privileged to translate the truth from God to men, and finally transferred from earth to heaven, then bear him away gently and blow a muted trumpet and lay him down softly. Place a two-edged sword on his coffin, raise the tomb triumphant, for he was a brave soldier of the word, and ere he died, he had become a man of God. Our Father, we thank you for the compelling commands of Scripture that define for us what it is that you expect. And beyond that, we thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit who lives within us, to enable us to be faithful to this. We pray for all these great, gifted,
trained, prepared men to be all that you would want them to be. May they be a force, men of God, faithful to the end. This is our prayer for your glory. Amen. It is my distinct privilege in representing the faculty to present you these graduates. Humanly speaking, they are the product of the Master Seminary, but more importantly, they are the products of the work of God in their lives. On behalf of the faculty, administration, and staff, I congratulate you, graduates, and pray God's richest blessing on you as you seek to glorify our Lord and Savior in the days ahead. Will the master's graduating class of 2016 please rise? President MacArthur, on behalf of the faculty of the Master's Seminary, it is a great honor to present to you these graduates who have successfully completed the requirements for their respective degrees. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors of the Master's College and Seminary and is authorized by the laws of the State of California and upon recommendation of the faculty, I confer upon the candidates now being presented by the Dean of the Seminary the respective degrees with all the attendants, rights, privileges, honors, and marks of distinction, in token of which I award the diploma and direct that each be invested with the hood which is emblematic of the degree. Will the graduates please take their places to my left? Before I read the names, let us note that the seminary has arranged for a professional photographer to take a picture of each graduate as he receives the degree. If you wish to receive a copy of any of these pictures, please contact the seminary office. To provide an added opportunity for picture taking, the graduates, Dr. MacArthur, and faculty members will remain in the patio area immediately following the service. Also, in keeping with the spirit of dignity and respect, we ask that you refrain from picture taking and applause while the names are being read and the degrees are being conferred. Opportunity to applaud the graduates will be given after all the degrees have been conferred. Thank you. Candidates for the Diploma of Theology degree, Michael Hovlin, summa cum laude. Jory Nunn. Jefferson Romulo. Candidates for the Bachelor of Theology degree, Dimitri Bondarak, magna cum laude. Cameron Butel, magna cum laude. William Chen, 
in absentia. Anthony Zlot. Candidates for the Master of Divinity degree. David Achilles. Toussaint Adams in absentia. Francisco Avila. Daniel Avula, magna cum laude. Craig Barnett, summa cum laude. Mark Blackburn, cum laude. Michael Butler. Eric Kai, cum laude. David Caldwell, magna cum laude. Angel Cardoza. Robert Chu. Jake Dye, magna cum laude. Aaron Darlington, summa cum laude. Joshua Doshiro, summa cum laude. Eric Durso. Stephen Dewey, summa cum laude. David Fall. Charlie Fernandez. Chad France, summa cum laude. Daniel Gao, summa cum laude. Scott Ganusi, magna cum laude. Edralyn Gonzalez, summa cum laude. Jade Greenfield. Carl Gusky, summa cum laude. Sherwood Hasty. Samuel Hahn. Erland Hardang. Roger Zhang. Paul Johnson, summa cum laude. Kevin Kimball, summa cum laude. Ian Kwan, cum laude. Joshua Liu.
Trevor Love, summa cum laude. William Meester, magna cum laude. Nicholas Malonis. Lloyd Murphy, magna cum laude. Steve Pruel. Brian Ragsdale, cum laude. Andre Randolph, summa cum laude. Michael Sahusen. Julian Seidel, magna cum laude. Alan Sherbun. Garrett Shimata. Joshua Slocum. Brett Smith. Daniel Snyder, magna cum laude. Jose Soria. Jimmy Tan. Thank you for your testimony, Jose. Jonathan Tempes, cum laude. Andre Tiganyanu. Matthew. Todd, Paul Twiss, summa cum laude, Roberto Van Dalen, cum laude, Daniel Wilson, magna cum laude, Jonathan Yang. Candidates for the Master of Theology degree. Matthew Butler. Philip Borisma, summa cum laude. Justin Chan in absentia. William Chan, summa cum laude. Fernando Hymas. Daniel Mount Pleasant, summa cum laude. Champalo Natal, summa cum laude. Lawrence Pickering. Ryan Quay, summa cum laude. Candidates for the Doctor of Ministry degree. Scott Basolo. Richard Caldwell. (laughs) 
Jean Paul Chenet. Randall Cook. Carl Hargrove. Stephen Lanetti. Jonathan Montoya. Stephen Schneider. Paul Shirley. Candidates for the Doctor of Theology degree, Bradley Clausen. John David Thompson. Now, will you please join me in applause for the Master's Seminary graduating class? Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> we have established a tradition of having a prayer of dedication for our graduates. Again this year, I'm asking that each of the graduates get on their knees and that the members of the board of directors, the seminary faculty, and the elders of Grace Community Church come forward, join them on their knees, and place their hands upon them where possible for our prayer of dedication. We invite all in the congregation to make this a time of united prayer for these graduates as we launch them out into ministry. Guys, if you'd come up, to take your place at the platform. Elders, faculty members.
Let's pray. Our Father, we commend to you these choice men chosen by you before the foundation of the world to belong to you, redeemed, given the Holy Spirit, gifted by the Holy Spirit, recognized by churches to have gifts that are suitable to ministry, externally, internally called with a driving passion to proclaim your truth. We will see these men move all around the world, and you have already prepared the way for them. We ask, Lord, that their story, their history, which is your story, will be everything that you would desire it to be. May they be the noblest and the best and the most faithful. We ask, Lord, that you would guard them as they guard your truth, shepherd them by your spirit as they shepherd your church, Instruct them in the many hours in their own study as they stand in pulpits to instruct others. Empower them so that they can do exceeding abundantly above all they can ask or think. And may they look back on their lives even as they live their lives and see your powerful hand. Grant them contentment with whatever it is that you call them to do, if it's a large and complicated ministry, give them the power and the energy to do that and to be humble. And if it is a, a smaller ministry, give them the grace to do it and be fully satisfied. It is enough for us to march in the triumph of Christ to play the part that you have ordained for us. But we believe, Lord, that these men are uniquely equipped beyond, beyond other men who've gone through other schools because of their deep and firm, unwavering commitment to your word and their devotion to preaching it faithfully. Use them in a mighty way, and may they influence many others. May many follow in their pathway, and even some who will come right to the Master Seminary because of their influence. Use them to raise up another generation of men to be trained. Lord, we ask that you would put your hand of blessing on them that you would keep them from stumbling and make them stand in the presence of your glory, blameless with great joy. And to you, the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. In Psalm 35, 28, we read, And my tongue shall speak of thy praise all the day long. Let's join together in song, O for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let's stand together as we sing.
remain standing for the benediction. Join me in prayer, will you please? Our Father and our God in heaven, praise be to you for who you are and for what you've done. We ask you this evening to aid us even now in the close of this service as we, as we seek to express our thanks to you for your loving kindness is indeed everlasting and has been marvelously manifested to us. What more can we say to you at this point than thank you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thirty years is but a drop in the oceans of eternity to you, but it is an amazing and enduring testimony to us of your absolute grace and kindness. We thank you for each of these men who stand as graduates before us this evening. We thank you for all their hard work. And most particularly, we thank you for the trials, triumphs, tragedies, and tests that you have carried them through these last few years, all intended to shape them into the men you want them to be so that they are indeed ready for the next service you have for them. Thank you, God, for their wives, for their families, for their churches, who have sacrificed to you so much for them and for their preparation for ministry. Thank you for this church, for Grace Community Church, who for 30 years has allowed us to be an extension of its ministry to the word, to the world. Thank you for the saints and elders of Grace Community Church who sacrificed so much of themselves to serve us and to allow many of these men to grow up as part of this work only to move on when they are finally beginning to demonstrate skill and wisdom in handling your word. Thanks for how willingly they sacrifice so much of the time and the energies of their pastors and of the staff of this church so that they can invest in these men who will year after year head out to serve you somewhere else around the world. Thank you for our own pastor and president who has been gifted by you with not only great skill in handling your word and great faithfulness by your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity you have given him to be here in this time and to be raised up at such a time as this to serve you. And thank you for a board of elders and directors who have readily shared the vision that you have given him for this work. Thank you for allowing us all to be a part of what you have been doing here for the last 30 years. Thank you for our many unseen and faithful donors who continue to be blessed by you with the privilege of participating in this work by investing sacrificially in these men and in all the work that goes on here. Thank you for our faculty and staff past and present, who have been so richly blessed and continue to be so richly blessed with the privilege of serving you and investing in men just like these men before us. Thank you for our alumni, my fellow brothers in Christ. Thank you for the privilege it is to study here and to grow up here. And thank you for the faithfulness that you continue to work in us and the ways that you continue to allow us to be a part of your kingdom and the furtherance of your glory here on this earth. And more than anything else, O oh Lord, thank you for loving us, for saving us, for setting us apart for your service, and for using us. You have never been dependent upon anyone to accomplish your purposes. In the past, you have used a donkey. You even affirmed on your entrance into Jerusalem on your final week, that you could use a rock. Tonight, we say thank you, O Lord, for using us. And we ask only that you would continue to find pleasure in bringing your chosen men to us for years to come, that we might have a part of in, in investing in them for your future work and for your glory. And we pray that you will aid us in continuing to do all that we can by your spirit to prepare them for your service in the future. And now we entrust these men and ourselves and our ministries to you, O oh God, in the wonderful and glorious name of our risen and ascended Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.